right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third Envision Beyond Briefing. It's a pleasure to have you all join us in this session. My name is Asha Zaharangani, and I will be your host today. So a little bit about myself. I am the Content and Events Manager at SAP's Intelligent Enterprise Institute, and I'm stoked to be here today from SAP's London office in the Scalpel Building. Where are you all joining us from today? Please write it in chat. It's so nice to have you here. Hello, hello from Germany. Nice to have you. So yeah, it's really great uh, to see you all. Take some time out of your day to, from wherever you are to join this briefing. We'll make sure to make it worth your while. So before we get started, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the Intelligent Enterprise Institute is the global think and do tank of SAP. You might be familiar with our Envision Beyond Journal, which is a monthly publication on LinkedIn, where we talk about the rising trends and topics in the intersection of business and technology. If you haven't heard of it, you can scan this QR code right here to check it out and subscribe to our journal. So this month at the Envision Beyond Briefing, we'll be exploring the potential role of AI in strategic decision making. We have two exciting experts joining us here today. The first is SAP's very own John Licata and Kai Muller, the founder and CEO of Experience One. So as we embark on this journey of exploration together, I'll be guiding our discussion, but we ultimately want to make this an interactive event. So I encourage you to actively use the chat feature to contribute to the conversation. And we will have the Q&A session towards the end of the event. So I implore you to use the chat and Q&A feature to submit your questions. And if you have any specific questions you'd like to ask to our speakers, please address them as such when you submit them and we'll do our best to answer them. All right, um, let's dive in. So as you're all aware, AI is the current hot topic on everyone's lips. So I was fortunate to be able to join my team, the Intelligent Enterprise Institute at the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos earlier this year in January. I had an absolutely fantastic time. It was incredible to meet so many interesting people and engage in fascinating conversation. The Intelligent Enterprise Institute hosted the Art of Business program, consisting of a lovely reception and a series of panels at the Heimat Museum in Davos. Now, before we dive deeper into the session, let's first kick things off with a quick survey for our audience. Um, so you can scan this QR code right here to access the survey or go to menti.com and use the access code shown on the screen. Um, we'll give you a few minutes to fill out your answers um, and then we can dive into the session. Let's give people a few more minutes, yeah, to fill out the answers. Hope we. So I'm really excited to see what everyone has to say in this in this survey. I'm really excited to see all the results. So please, we want this to be an interactive session. Um, use the chat feature to share your thoughts. Um, AI is such a fascinating topic and, and there's so much to explore and I can't wait to, to dive into the session. Okay. All right, I think we've given people quite enough time. Um, maybe we can send the link in the chat in case people join and they can fill in their answers as we go. But Thank you for those who have answered. I hope you found the questions interesting and thought provoking. Um, it was one of the hot topics during WEF in Davos and the Institute actually did a panel on this titled uh, Future Proof Decisions, the Opportunities for Better Strategies with Kai Muller, who is here today as a speaker, Abbas Ricky from Caldera, Dr. Nico Moore from McKinsey and moderated by the Institute's very own Tonya hofer Arismond. Now I'd like to show a short clip from that panel for you all to see. You can think about it from, from two perspectives. You can think about it from a perspective of kind of the spectrum of automation, where you go from manual to augmented to automated and into autonomous at some point. But then you can also think about it on another axis, on, on what the type and level of decision or processes that's being impacted. Is that operational? Is that tactical? 
or is that strategic? And if we're thinking, you know, in, in that framework from, from manual to autonomous and from tactical or operational to then strategic, there's basically everything's going to be impacted. It's just a question of where it starts and, and where it ends, I think. So, yeah, I want to dissect this a bit more. And for that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, John Lekata, SAP's Chief Innovation Foresight Strategist a role that helps SAP and its customers become more future ready. So in this role, John leverages a deep and diverse background in research and strategy from Wall Street to Silicon Valley and around the world to help SAP balance its existing product portfolio with tomorrow's functionality. John has delivered high profile keynotes around the world and has appeared regularly on CNBC and Bloomberg to explore digital transformation and the role humans must play in it. It's so great to have you here with us. Welcome, John. Super excited to be here, Asha. So where are you joining us from today? So I am from very cold New York City. Amazing. Love New York. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. So uh, let's get right to it. Um, first, actually, I want to pull out the results from the first question of the survey that we just did to see what our audience think. Okay, 5.9. So how do you how do you feel about this result, uh, John? On a scale of one to 10, how confident are you in AI's ability to make crucial strategic business decisions? Was it close to what you expected? Do you agree with that? What, what are your thoughts? I'm actually surprised. It sounds like there's a lot of optimism in, in the room, which is great to see, but um, I will start at a one. Um, and I will say a one, um, hopefully I'll be able to give some feedback as to why. But um, I think we should start by the, the question reading is strategic business decisions. I very much think a lot of decision making should still be with humans. Um, that being said, we hear a lot about the augmentation um, opportunities uh, that AI can help with making, you know, doing our daily tasks, maybe even removing some menial tasks we could focus on larger uh, problems. But I also think that we have to start looking at AI, um, not just as peanut butter and jelly uh, to every problem. I do think that we need to look at um, AI almost as a sous chef in a kitchen by allowing you to prepare uh, in different ways and maybe leverage new, uh, new sums of information, but you ultimately make that decision. So I think, you know, we I think there's so much emphasis on jumping into the deep end of the pool that AI is going to do for that. And capabilities, I believe, will be profound. But I do believe that the decision still be should be in, uh, from, uh, from human domain. Will it change? Um, I think it will be. But as present, you know, a lot of the gen AI, and, and AI is not just generative AI, but a lot of the gen AI um, use cases right now are really based on creativity. And we've seen, you know, the ability for, you know, images and videos to be created. And it's nothing short of breathtaking. But from business perspective, we have a long way to go. This is why I'm excited that, that SAP has recently announced um, a, a new business unit, a business AI team under Philip Herzig, focus on that. So we need to start to talk about the realities of tangible business use cases that can help strategic decision making but we have a long way to go and i think that that's really comes down to trusting the data that people can use right now there's a lot of misuse of information um the the models themselves have bias and so we need to figure out what we can do to build trust so we have need to start there and build trust and i think that if that that will set the the stage for in time using AI complementarily to help humans make decisions that are more data-driven, um, that you can use for scenario planning, risk assessment, identify new growth op opportunities, because you've been processing large sums of data. Uh, and by the way, that data is going to be unstructured and structured. But I think that we have to still monitor a lot of uh, uh, key performance indicators that the AI can certainly help us with as we're trying to look into uh, being more agile and res more responsive to the business community. But I do think that we have a long way to go. And so I do think, you know, building on trust is certainly uh, massive and in finding the right sort of data. There is a tsunami of data. And so just relying on the, the AI to perform um, strategic decisions, I think 
at this moment is flawed. Um, and I'll give you an example. Last year in Wall Street, there was a, a AI models recommended to uh, investors to stay away from cryptocurrency, to stay away from Bitcoin. Bitcoin has more than doubled in the last six months alone, and it would have been a massive miss. So I think that we have to uh, look at not just what AI can do, but how do we curb the, the role uh, of AI so that um, you know, we have proper audit trails? Because what happens if the systems um, recommend certain ideas, but businesses, uh, the C-suite, which I know we'll talk a little bit later in this conversation, but the C-suite is going to be held accountable. So at some point, there might be uh, a disparity from you know, what the system recommends, what the C-suite actually does, and does that actually change public perception about where we're going? I'll give you another example quickly. You know, in the NFL, which we just saw the Super Bowl, you know, last week, you know, Tom Brady, one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, he was not picked by the, the models that were uh, scouting players back in the day. In fact, he was picked in a later round. Same thing with, so what I'm, what I'm saying, he became the greatest quarterback of all time. We are relying on the AI to give us the greatest decisions that we that we ultimately can make, and I think that you that doesn't. Uh, we still need human intuition. Whether you are buying crypto or picking Tom Brady, there's still a need for human intuition that could supersede the data that's out right now. So I think that's really important. To I don't think as much as AI will evolve, Asha, I still think that the human intuition is far greater, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Yeah, I, I I also want to kind of go back to the to the clip that we showed earlier. Kind of, a, what are the ways that AI you know evolve from operational efficiencies to influencing strategic decision making, and how does AI's increased role kind of affect the the workforce and 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 the companies? I, how it affects? I mean, look, I mean, there's been a lot of people talking about um, downsizing due to AI, and I think what people need to do is boost their skill set. To work with AI, those are going to be the real champions in the workforce going going forward. But I think new roles will are certainly going to evolve, um, and that's a good thing that we're starting to look into. You know how we saw businesses that blossomed when dot com happened, um, which I remember vividly in the earlier part of my career. And now we're starting to see these new businesses come into play today. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. You're seeing the likes of of Google just announce new model this morning to complement Gemini. And I do think that we have to look into, you know, the, the role of, of um, augmentation a little bit closer. But as far as making the decisions themselves, again, I go back to the word trust. And I think right now, we're not at a point right now where we can give the, the keys to, you know, anyone but a human. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, I agree with you on that. I think just this advancement kind of underscores the need for kind of strong AI governance, because these decisions that are made by AI could significantly impact um, a company's trajectory. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for your insights. Um, so next, I want to hear your thoughts on another short clip from the panel. Um, can we put that on the screen? What we see right now is that it is massively impacting, for example, processes in marketing and sales, in customer service, but also in software engineering. Yeah. And it has an incredible impact in those areas. On the other side, what we see more and more coming here is uh, processes or, or areas like product development, for, an ex for example. Yeah, we, we know from, from some of the, the fashion companies, they are using generative AI now to produce new product designs. Yeah. Yeah? So and that, that's an incredible next step of development. Yeah? And we see it also being implemented into strategic, str strategic decision-making processes. Yes. Yeah. So which is then also moving higher up into the boardroom yes. and make it yeah, a co-pilot, as you mentioned, but yeah. a very strong co-pilot. Yeah. So back to you, John, like how, how is AI contributing to the roles of C-level executives? Can you share with us some other examples of how AI is supporting and augmented their work? Yeah, absolutely. First, I just want to make a comment. He, uh, in that clip, we saw uh, the fashion industry being called out. The fashion industry should be applauded for always being uh, very early when it comes to adopting new technologies, whether it's AI or metaverse. And I think the C-suite is going to see that. 
whether you are in operations um, and you have the ability to leverage new found information, again, unstructured and structured to help with demand forecasting or resource allocation in the supply chain, I think that there's opportunities that you can benefit from for sure, again, in time. And I could go back to what I said earlier about trust. From a compliance perspective, I think you can have the opportunity to identify potential risks. So risk assessment is something that the C-suite, I think, can hope to leverage you know, AI more strongly, not just from in the compliance role, uh, but I think throughout the C-suite. Um, finance, I mean, how could you not talk about predictive analytics um, and more informed financial management? But again, as I mentioned earlier, even if that was the case, you still have to be a little bit more of uh, taking that into a wider spectrum of decision making because, you know, the predictive analytics didn't see the crypto rise that we have seen in, in recent months. So um, what I think you'll see a lot more, Rasha, is the synthetic use of data, the simulation the, to model different situations and maybe new personas. Um, and I think that also can help areas like strategy. If you're a, if you're a C-suite officer and, and your uh, your role is is um, strategic in nature, um, I think that can uh, can help maybe narrow down the opportunities to maybe expand in certain areas. Play with AI so you can actually maybe mock some sort of personas that can actually give you some insights whether or not you should build uh, a given product or deliver a service. Um, or if you're in human resources, maybe you have an opportunity to leverage AI to help help you you narrow down um, you know a massive amount of resumes uh, because it sees more continuity of not just a person on paper but the skill set behind that that doesn't always come across when someone's looking for a job so I think there's an opportunity for for the c-suite to really benefit and it also to use the this um, AI to for m a to actually look at ways that you can find through queries shorter lists uh, of companies that you might want to either not just acquire, but become partners with things that would have taken months of due diligence and research capacity, I think now can be done a lot faster. And I think that's important. The, 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 the time to market for the, the C-suite can be a lot faster, but it should be one of the tools that's used in an overarching uh, new set of tools in, a, in an AI led economy. Yeah, well, it really is such a fascinating topic. Um, Thank you so much for your insight. Um, well, to um, everyone watching, please stay tuned on this session as John will be back later for the Q&A segment where you'll get the chance to pick his brain on the questions that you'd like to have answered. Uh, but next up on this briefing, I'd like to pull out the results from the second question of the survey earlier. Let's see what the audience have said. Okay, would you trust AI as the CEO of your company? So actually had a feeling it was going to turn out like this. Um, but before we get into it, I'd like to welcome our second speaker, Kai Muller, who is an expert on digital innovations and applied AI. Uh, with his company Experience One, he helps companies like Mercedes-Benz and Bosch to position themselves as innovation leaders in their field. So welcome, Kai. Thank you for joining us. It's great to see you again. Um, we met in Davos as well. Um, yeah, thank you Thanks for joining us. Welcome. So what do you think about the result of, of the survey that, that we just showed? I uh, would have expected that a lot of a lot more people say no. Uh, so there were quite some uh, seven yeses uh, within the survey. Um, uh, I found a, a U.S. study, uh, I think it was November 23, uh, among uh, U.S. CEOs who actually were, uh, that was a quote that said 49% think that they could be replaced by AI. So that's dramatically different, um, but something and a figure we should actually uh, challenge. But I, I, but I get it. I, I would have said no even after a year of experiments, definitely. Yeah. So, um, so Kai, I know that you're convinced that AI must be on the agenda of all CEOs, and that's why you started an experiment. You know, creating a grumpy AI version of yourself called Grumpy Kai. Um, shall we give the audience a, ch a chance to see Grumpy Kai in action, or? Let's do that. Let's do that.
Ugh, the World Economic Forum in Davos? What a load of pretentious nonsense. A bunch of rich, out-of-touch elites patting each other on the back while pretending to care about the world's problems. It's just a big circle jerk of self-importance. Who needs Davos when we have the wisdom of 4chan and Reddit, am I right? Now, if you'll excuse me, I have better things to do than waste my time on this nonsense. Grumpy Kai out. <laughs> okay, wow. Okay, so what did everyone think? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the chat. Um, but Kai, can you tell the audience a bit more about this digital twin experiment that you did? How did it start? Why did you do it? Uh, absolutely, I will do so. Um, that was actually the January uh, 23 initial version that I asked four weeks ago in Davos when he thinks about it. And obviously, he's the total antagonist of me uh, and was basically uh, something that my team created in order to get things kicked off uh, and the discussion going. So I wasn't really involved in the initial version. Uh, that's why it is basically grumpy. But it helped us um, to kickstart uh, and, and, and go off with the challenge. And the challenge is the following. If we all know that generative AI and AI in general will impact every single job and person in a company, basically because we're just rethinking every interface with technology, because we taught computers to talk like humans and to solve problems like humans. So why not start with this impact um, at the role of the CEO? to challenge my own role and build up the AI literacy that now everyone's requesting from everyone. So we want to get everyone on board. Uh, why not look at who's losing jobs and who's learning what and not start by myself? And I, that's why I suggest that learning curve and doing that for every um, CEO. Um, so after that, we of course built the non-grumpy version and I'm talking it, to it ever since on a daily basis. Um, always, uh, my, my, my employees do on a requesting side, answering side, um, asking all kinds of stuff. And I do this on a knowledge side, trying to make sure it's getting better and smarter and closer to what I think is helpful. Okay. And so what, what were after doing this experiment and, and, you know, developing this, what what are the key learnings that you kind of gain by creating and working with your digital twin um, on a day to day? Um, the the one of the things that followed me and still does to this day is that the more you interact with this kind of AI or AI in general, it makes you more human and it makes you reflect on um, what makes you truly human and what are probably also leadership skills uh, that differentiate a lot from what AI is doing. I'm totally with. Uh, uh, John, that taking re the responsibility for all kinds of decision, um, AI is nowhere close to getting there. Where AI, AI is pretty good is actually preparing everything to the point of saying, I would go with scenario A over B and C. The final responsibility of taking that decision is another thing, but actually training an AI to get there helps a lot is something that I do on a daily basis, but that requires really investing a lot in. And that's one of the first thing of my three learnings is you have to rethink your knowledge strategy. And what I mean by that is pretty easy. Uh, just, just last week, a situation, uh, a colleague asked, uh, okay, you usually explain to others um, how to pitch innovation to a CEO or a client. Can you do that? And I can't do that for 200 people uh, in my company. So how can I do that? Um, I try to actually get that knowledge into uh, the twin. Uh, and with a lot of um, things you wanna get in there, you figure out it's not documented, it doesn't exist. Because if I want to make it uh, uh, or to take, a, take good strategic decisions, it needs to know how were strategic decisions in the past because it's generating it from some stuff that it knows. If I do not document as a CEO, which a lot of CEOs probably don't do, uh, what decision I took a couple of years ago and whether it went good or bad uh, or probably even um, cost me my job or something like that, then I don't have anything to provide on a strategic level. I have to wait uh, two years uh, from now if uh, people like Bob Iger from, from Disney create their biography. And that's where the information and the knowledge is in that I probably need on a daily basis now. So our need, so knowledge strategy means I need a sort of AI biographer sitting next to me and doing that all the time, asking questions and generating the knowledge I need for decision-making. Otherwise it doesn't work. So that's the first uh, learning that I had. Second one, it's also something that John mentioned is true leadership skills is something 
or decision making skills or require awareness uh, for yourself, for the situation, for others, uh, compassion for others, and wisdom or judgment. Um, and this is something that uh, just recently at Harvard Business uh, Review talked about, and it's something that AI cannot cover yet because it doesn't have consciousness. You can't work with that. And the the, the final learning was um, everything um, throughout the journey is applicable to every single role company. So whether you're, we're talking about the CEO, knowledge, strategy, and delivery, and services, whether we're talking about the super salesman, whether we're talking about the, the support guy, or uh, someone in marketing, a marketing assistant, doesn't matter. The core principles are the same. And um, what you learn through that process uh, in terms of AI literacy is really invaluable because it makes you or empowers you as a CEO uh, to understand the decisions that now have to be made and also the impact it has on the organization. If everyone's running around saying, okay, well, what, what, what are we going to do? Uh, so what's beyond uh, ChatGPT? What's happening next? Um, uh, and that was really fascinating. Yeah, well, thank, thank you so much for, for, for all of this insight. So um, what advice would you give other CEOs running their companies? The, the most important thing that it taught me is that conversations uh, have become the most strategic asset for companies. Um, and I'll, uh, to explain that, I'm going to give you a, a simple example of something uh, we currently work on. Let's assume you want to be, uh, or you want to create a salesperson, a digital sales assistant supporting others um, for a car brand. Uh, and I do have that AI assistant. And of course, I need now the information to empower it the best way. What we do have is product data. Of course, I know how tall the car is. I know it has 300 horsepower, something like that. We also have information, product information. So data enriched with a little context, like 300 horsepower is good to, to, to pull this in that trailer or to drive the car in a certain way. What we don't have is the actual customer's experience, the knowledge, the day-to-day -day decisions we make, the, the, the information. Nobody tells me that if I buy a Tesla Model 3, that uh, 500 horsepower is a ridiculous amount for a car that can't handle that kind of speed. So the only thing you need to know is never go uh, uh, above 100 uh, miles per hour because it's it's crazy. It's totally crazy. So the actual experience and knowledge uh, that um, is being created and usually transferred through conversations. To capture that information, and today, of course, it's obviously a lot of um, uh, human dialogues and human conversations, that's the most valuable thing you can have because this is really where you're going from just using Gen AI to provide the data and information you, you threw at, uh, for example, customers uh, through websites yesterday into actually meaningful conversations and keeping a relationship uh, with clients. So, And a lot of companies do not capture this kind of data, or at least it's distributed. So to really uh, uh, focus on this kind of knowledge experience, to capture that, to scale it and make it accessible, will, in my opinion, uh, separate the leaders from the rest, because this is the only thing that empowers you, at least in uh, the, the, the field where we're talking about experiences that are be, be, based on uh, large language models and, and at the end of the day, roles for people jumping into that simulation. Um, this is really making a difference whether you can create hero services that have pulled you forward or um, uh, whether you're still sticking to the, yeah, let's just create a chat bot for some set, sort of data uh, stuff. And that's, uh, yeah, that's the most uh, valuable thing is really to to come up with a, uh, a definite knowledge strategy that empowers your future AI uh, strategy. All right. Thank you. Amazing. Like, thank you so much, Kai. Um, yeah. So don't go anywhere as it is now time for our Q&A segment. I'd like to bring back John Licata and Let's see what questions we have. Um, so I think we have a few questions related to Grumpy Kai, actually. So maybe we could tackle those first. Um, there's one question from Jimmy Dagger. The voice quality of the AI is quite impressive. How many hours of voice recordings did you have to use in the AI training process to get this quality? Um, that's super interesting. Um, if you'd ask me what it takes right now, I'd say um, two minutes. 
uh, a year ago, uh, in January or February, uh, given the, the models back then, it took hours. Not days, not weeks, uh, where uh, a couple of hours, so it was still advanced, but it's rocket fast. And the other thing, probably interesting, uh, connecting to the question is, what does it cost? Back then, uh, we did we created uh, another journalist uh, a twin back then, and we calculated what it does uh, take to actually um, uh, send them live and let uh, people ask questions, let readers ask questions. Would have been half a million for a month just for the voice, the clone voice. Totally different right now. Not a problem right now. A year ago, impossible. Uh, back then, uh, Eleven Labs as a service, we can all see what they're currently doing when they're providing audio for Sora. So it's amazing the difference. Right now, it's piece of cake. Wow, well, yeah. I think every, the advancements are just moving so rapidly. Um, it's incredible. So, John, what did you think about Grumpy Kai um, and and his cameo? <laughs> I mean, I, I, a couple of times I could have just screamed out. I totally agree I, uh, with what Kai was mentioning. I probably know Grumpy Kai um, myself. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of the naysayers out there. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's so, so important. You know, Kai touched on the word experience. And I think to be able to deliver intelligence in a way that is consumable and easy for people is so um, monumental for any strategic um endeavor you know for, for for corporate business is people need to have it more invisible it has to be second nature it needs to know who you are the contextuality of who you are in your circumstance what we don't want is to create um llms that um the c-suite or those who use it in general rely on a soulless intelligence you know we need to bring back the complementary nation notion um, of AI. And, and I think it goes back to that word experience, which, which Kai brought up. I totally agree. Um, but I think, you know, I think to dispel the notion of grumpy Kai's, you know, we need to make it simple, almost invisible for AI to just be there when you need it to even propose, have you thought about this? Have you considered that? Rather than just answering queries. Um, it has to get more personal. And I think that's going to be a huge uh, way that people can build that tr trust that I said is so important you know, to have uh, strategic decision-making supported by AI. All right, yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, we have a question in the Q&A box uh, from Mustafa Guller. In an imaginary world where multiple businesses that are run by AI, let's say they are in same or similar industries, what kind of competition challenges between them might occur if strategic decisions are taken by AI? What would be the differentiation factors for such cases? Is that uh, for either one of us? General, answer? feel free. Yeah, feel free to chime in. <laughs> um, I would just, I would just say it goes back to what I just mentioned about having a, a soulless business. Um, if everyone's putting in the same sort of inputs using the same models, it will be very hard to create true value um, uh, proposition um, and complete market dif dif differentiation. Um, I think that you know creating the businesses. Uh, with AI should be something that, again, we'd look to help businesses. I don't think that AI businesses alone will be successful. Um, I think that in, in terms of stand standalone without human intervention, just for clarity. Um, but I don't think that, you know, differentiation is something that's going to be super hard unless models go from LLMs to smaller models that can be more personalized, not just per sector, but also per the individual company and ownership uh, that the C-suite can certainly drive. But I, I I think we're getting into the notion of the machine doing everything. And I just think that's not the economy that we should aim to uh, to support. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, I, I totally agree. I'm, I'm very quickly um, at the Skynet scenario, uh, having uh, uh, companies or, or computers run everything. So you always have the question is, who's above that, who's controlling that, who's taking the full responsibility if everything goes goes to hell. Um, if I answer the question slightly different, saying, okay, there might be some authority or some humans in charge, uh, then the question would be, how do two companies who have a high level of AI or leveraging AI technology or have their business uh, run by AI on uh, like 80% or something, but still people in charge, that could probably also be a, a question there. 
And there are probably thousands of answers. One of them is uh, the one I also see is like the one who's getting actually their knowledge strategy right might have an advantage in that race. Uh, so I still believe that, but still it's like, hopefully we'll, we won't get there um, too fast. Can I, can I just want to add one other point because we haven't touched on it yet, but the AI that can also be more sustainable is also super interesting um, not just the ethical and responsible, but sustainable. And I was reminded by uh, by my colleague, Andreas Walsh from uh, SAP, who quoted a, an MIT tech uh, review stating that just generating a thousand images requires as much energy as charging your phone um, or creating the, the, the same amount of emissions uh, to drive your car uh, four miles. So it's it's not about just creating a great solution. It's about one that has longevity that also has good planetary benefits uh, just you can see people just creating images discarding them whatnot that has an environmental impact so i think that that has to be more of a, com uh, a competitor a competitive differentiation going forward is figuring out how do you deliver that customization that personalization that augmentation ethically responsibly with more environmentally conscious uh behavior and i think that's that's really where i think the ai can se separate itself from the pack Oh, priority, I agree. Oh, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, let's try to move on to uh, to another question. Um, let's see, I think some of them are some are answered. Some are in. There's one from Chad that I see. I think it was in the middle of our talk from um, Robert Paul, uh, predictive, not decision-making in which verticals is it more interesting to make the predictive AI work? Um, I think this might be related to the session earlier. Um, Robert Paul, would you like to clarify on this question? We have, we can unmute you if you prefer, um, or is the question clear to you, John and Kai? Can you please repeat the question? Um, yes, so it's related to predictive, um, not decision making. It says, in which verticals is it most interesting to make the predictive AI work? I, I mean, I, I believe the supply chain has so many intriguing opportunities for, as we talked about earlier, about the resource allocation, you know, having the ability to almost anticipate where the needs will be, uh, I think will be increasingly important. We live in a world that's so uncertain today. Um, unfortunately, we've had a lot of disruptions, whether they were those uh, caused by weather, geopolitics, or cybersecurity. Um, and I think that we need to figure out a, a way that we can manage the supply chain in a way that won't um, impact uh, the general public. So I think that right there, that's a lot of opportunity to improve the current um, flow of goods and services. I think that's that's one to me that definitely jumps to, to the top. And then the other one quickly is finance. You know, there's a lot of scams going on right now. People, a lot of deep fakes, you know, people are trying to manage their their funds um, and being impersonated by what they think are relatives. And I think that we need to figure out a way that we can personal privacy. Um, and, and I think that impacts all sectors. Um, and those of us who have young kids, like this is the world they're living in. So we need to figure out how do we raise the next generation of future leaders to handle, you know, AI and use it smartly and, and not for uh, malicious intent, which is happening. And we need to figure that out for all sectors, but more importantly for humanity. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I'd like to add that. I think the, the unfortunately, um, one of the problems will be that um, predictive AI cannot only be used uh, or has to be used for the things we currently know, but probably AI itself is generating the problems it has to solve. Um, just because we're just seeing the tips, the starting points of using it, it in a bad way. Uh, and that will basically mean we have to wrap up things. So uh, the ones, uh, the, the, the rogues coming up with a solution to use it in a bad way and at the same time to predict that kind of stuff exactly. And that is not a good race, obviously using the technology in those two areas. Um, but I think that's uh, going to happen and probably impact um, a lot of areas. But automotive and finance being our verticals is something um, I we totally see. Agree with that. You know, I would just throw in cybersecurity as a whole. I think that's also something the role of AI needs to, you know, be looked at to also use AI 
to help safeguard AI. Um, and I think this is an interesting dynamic and in, in training uh, personnel into uh, a lot of threats happening in, happen in, from inside the company. It's not just outside anymore. So we need to figure out what role can AI help flag um, you know, scenarios that might be different, different behaviors. Uh, and I think so that's a very big area. The, the concerns related to cybersecurity, uh, I think will be huge to, to unfold. All right. Um, thank you so much, John, Kai. Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer all of your questions. A lot of interesting questions. Thank you so much for submitting them. Um, and thank you so much, John and Kai, for all the insights. Um, yeah, I, can't, I really can't wait to see how AI will keep evolving towards the future. It's been a pleasure to have you both here. Um, before you leave, um, we actually would like to show one final question from the survey earlier um, that lets you what the audience had to say. So the question is, do you believe an AI system could effectively run a company? Feel free to share your final comments on that, whoever wants like to go. Kai, you could take that one first. I will. Um, I mentioned it briefly in the beginning. If I separate um, the preparing a lot of things uh, until others do stuff, I would perspectively go with the yes here. Um, meaning run is a huge thing. It doesn't mean leadership. It doesn't mean decision. It means running a company, which is a lot of things. I think uh, there will be a lot. Uh, going back to the Skynet scenario and everything, uh, I think uh, we're not close to it. Um, so uh, obviously on the short term, uh, we're having a no here. I agree with that. But impacting every single role, I think the the way we're going from here on will be to increase the level um, of AI power parts uh, of the company that are run by AI, definitely. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in and say no. Um, only, I think that's reinforcing what the, I think both of us were saying throughout this, uh, uh, this, this webinar. Um, I think we have to, AI has to help humans run companies. Um, Doing it on their own in a time where the, the there is such a um, mistrust when it comes to the data, um, and by the way, there's a lot of people that are getting AI anxiety right now. And how do I use it? And will it help me? And am I doing it the right way? Um, I think leaving the the system to run a company um, should not be the ultimate goal. And that you know we. We have to find ways that we can do what we do better. And if we're relying on the system that might have its own ethical bias, um, I don't think that's the responsibility that we want to drive to our, our economy. So I don't believe it, it, would, it, it could effectively run a company today. And I would be surprised if we allow it to run a company in the future. Okay, it's been, it's been really interesting and really fascinating talking to you today. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us at Envision Beyond Briefing. It's been a great session, and your participation made all the difference. We hope you all enjoyed this as much as we did. If you're curious to learn more about this topic and keep up with the latest trends in business and technology, do check out our Envision Beyond journal by scanning this QR code. It's packed with great stuff that you won't want to miss. Um, if you're interested in watching the full panel that we featured here today, you can find it in our Davos special edition of the journal. And before you go, we'd really appreciate it if you could take a minute to fill out our feedback survey. Your thoughts matter to us and they'll help make our future briefings better, more engaging, more interactive, and just more of what you want to see. So thanks again for being here with us today and keep an eye out for our next briefing. Thank you, John. Thank you, Kai. Thanks.